Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the weather report here with FX Street. <clears throat> My name is Chris Capri, founder of Second Skies. Today's class is upon the Ichimoku cloud uh, as not just an indicator but as a, as a method for trading. Um, before we get into the nature of the cloud and what this class is going to be about and the material, which we've got a lot of really exciting stuff for today, uh, first, I just want to let you all, I'm not a priest, and I'm not giving a sermon here, and so with that being said, I encourage participation in questions. Um, if there's anybody new, uh, I do recognize a lot of the names here, but I'm also starting to see a lot of new names here. And so if you're new, I totally welcome you to this class. We will be going over the basics of the cloud uh, construction, and then what we're going to be doing is getting into some unique points about the cloud, some things that are kind of the more subtle points that we haven't had time to go over yet uh, as I've been teaching this class for months. But at any point in time, whether you're new or been here for a while, uh, if you have any questions, I want you to feel like this is a totally open forum. You can ask at any time. Uh, again, I like it to be an organic process, and I'm not a priest giving a sermon here, so that means you guys can kind of jump in at any point in time. Uh, I'll field the question when I feel it's uh, appropriate, but I usually field it pretty fast. And so I want you to feel like your questions will be answered. And so uh, with all that being said, I want to thank you all for coming. It's good having you here. And let's begin today's show. So what you're seeing here, this little chart, is of the Ichimoku cloud. Now, actually, it's slightly adjusted. And I'll tell you why. Because normally, the Ichimoku cloud has all those components you saw except for this purple line here. This purple line uh, is something that I delete. Uh, and before I get into the rest of the cloud, I just want to talk about why I delete it. This purple line is called the Chiku span. And the Chiku span basically takes the current price wherever it's at and sends it 26 time periods back and tries to give you a visual cue via a line. How the current price action relates to previous support and resistance. So if price action is below it or above it, uh, that kind of tells you where the line of least resistance is. Uh, but you won't see it on my chart because I feel like we can do that visually, so to me it seems superfluous. Now, with all these other components, before I start to describe them, I just want to real briefly talk about what the Ichimoku plot is. It's a trending type indicator. Uh, it's best used in trends. It's not that it doesn't have information in ranges. It actually has a ton of information in ranges. But it has, uh, it's best used in trending type environments. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be in a big downtrend on a daily chart to do that. You could just be capturing part of a short-term trending move that lasts less than a day. Um, and so with all that being said, um, the cloud is actually a leading indicator. And as you can see, it's sent into the future, very much like uh, uh, Michael J. Fox at 66 miles an hour. So he went back to the future and everything. This thing actually goes into the future. So it classifies as a leading indicator. Um, with all that being said, the part that really goes into the future is this Kumo, this cloud. This cloud is designed to represent support and resistance. And I'll get to your question in a second here, Zul. Um, the cloud is designed to represent support and resistance. So anytime, anytime you're ever looking at the cloud and what it means in relationship to current price action and future price action, always think of it as support and resistance. If you can do that, you will be able to unpeel the inner layers of what the cloud is selling or saying. Not selling, saying. Could be selling too. That is how you want to relate to it. The thicker the cloud, the thicker the supporter resistance is. The thinner the cloud, the easier it is for the pair to reverse. Um, it also kind of tells you where the line of least resistance is. As long as price action is below it and it's thick, the line of least resistance is to the downside. And if it's thick and the price section is above it, the line of least resistance is to the upside. If it's thin, then we have an, a pretty equal chance of it going up or down. So that is the basics of the cloud. Now, going back to where I want to, um, there are other components of the Ichimoku cloud. There are these lines here, these white and red lines. They're exponential moving averages. They are a white. Uh, the white is a Tenkin line. That's what it's called. Also the same name as the Tenkin survey, Tenkin line. It's a nine period EMA. And the red is a Kijun line. It's a 26 period EMA. Okay, now with all that being said, 
the way you generally derive signals is through the crossover of the Tenkin and the Kijun line, very much like MACD. When you have uh, a general upward crossover, that's considered to be a very generic bullish signal. When you have a downward crossover, the Tenkin over the Kijun line, like this one here, it's considered a generic bearish signal. Uh, that doesn't mean that we take the trade. Um, some Ichimoku traders will take that with other conditions following. I don't take all crossovers. Um, I just want to real briefly go over the types of crossovers, get into some of this material, and since your question, Zool, is a market question, I want to save that one for when we, have, uh, when we start talking directly about the current environment in the markets. So if you don't mind waiting until then, it'll just be you know, a handful of minutes, but we'll definitely get to your question. So thanks, thanks in advance for your patience. So where the crossover occurs in relationship to the cloud is what determines or qualifies the strength of the signal. If you cross over to the downside above the cloud, that's considered a weak signal because you're getting the impetus for the signal before you've cleared through support. If you get that crossover inside the cloud, like one of these, it's considered medium because you've cleared through some of it, but not all of it. And if you get the sell signal below the cloud, you've cleared through all the support. It's considered a strong signal. The reverse, it's the exact reverse or inverse for the buys. It's a weak signal if you get the crossover below the cloud. If you get an upward crossover inside the cloud, it's medium. And if you get above the cloud, it's strong because you've cleared through all the resistance. So that's the basics, very basics, or elemental components about the Ichimoku cloud itself. Now, there are other things involved which can also kind of hint at the strength of the signal or whether you really want to get involved or not. The cloud, as you can see, has two different colors to it. There's this white portion, there's this blue portion, and the shading is just everything in between that space. The white portion is what we call Senku Span A. Senku Span A basically takes the current price, or it takes the two uh, moving averages, and I can zoom forward and show you this takes these two moving averages, divides it in half, chops it right down the middle, sends it 26 time periods ahead. Boom. The Senku Span B is a little bit different. It takes the last 52 candles, so it's incorporating price action in the range of it. It takes the high and the low of the last 52 candles and divides that in half. My guess is this is the high and the low. And there you go, like magic, there shows up the 50% Fibonacci ratio. That is the components of the cloud and how it calculates it. Sync to span A and sync to span B. Now, I want to go back to this one point here. It's very important. There are two points that I want to go over today, actually three points. These are more uh, how to really understand the nature of the clouds. These are all actually centered around the clouds, which I feel is the most important component of trading the Ichimoku cloud is the actual cloud itself, the Kumo. One of the things is that here we have this crossover, this downward crossover, and it's a medium signal. And to actually complete the signal, just because you get the crossover doesn't mean you jump in the trade. Uh, just because you get the crossover doesn't mean it's the World Series of Poker and we're all in. You have to wait for price action to break the cloud. Some camps, traditionally Chimoka camps, would say, you know what, at the time of the crossover, you already have to be closing or you already have to be outside the cloud and close outside the cloud. That's one camp. There's another camp that says when you get the crossover, you just wait until the actual price action breaks out of the cloud. Um, some say it needs to close out. Some say it just needs to break by a minimum of pips. I say it needs to break by a minimum of pips. What are those? I say 12 pips on a 30-minute or one-hour time frame. On a daily chart, it's a slightly different entity. And we won't get into that today. That's a whole different setup. But this is the interesting part about it. Here we get this crossover. Price almost breaks out of it, but it doesn't do it. Then it performs an upward crossover. So it never breaks out to the downside. So therefore, we never get the impetus to complete the signal. Then it crosses over to the upside. By definition, that's a medium signal. However, there's one other subtler component here that makes this a little bit different. I want you to look at the space between this white line in this white line here. There are many of you that have been coming to this class for a while, months and months and months, and really been getting into the nature of the Ichimoku Cloud. 
Okay, now this is a medium signal, and my general rule is if it breaks out of the cloud after the crossover by 12 pips, we get in the trade. As soon as it breaks that 12 pips, we're in. Now, technically that means that if the cloud is coming in right here, oops, wrong line. The cloud's coming in at 36.76, then we should be getting in at 88. We'll just call that 88 right there. So technically, we should be getting in at 88. Now, is there anything that you can detect inside the cloud from this line to this line that would suggest that this may not be the best signal to get into, or that there may be something inside of it that is suggesting it's a little bit weaker than normal? Any guesses or any information there, or any ideas whatsoever? Anybody gets this, oh my. You definitely get the, the brilliant Ichimoku Award. You will have uh, graduated from grasshopper level. And uh, you might even uh, pull the coin out of my hand uh, before I actually close my hand. OK, a couple of you are close. Cloud getting narrow, cloud totally, cloud is thinner. OK, so you all, you all caught on to one component, that the cloud is getting thinner. That is a very good component. <clears throat> um, and Shep is saying the cloud switching. Do you mean this flipping over here? Is that what you're referring to there, Shep? Uh, for those of you, Jerry, Paul, G, and Gibby, that say cloud is thinner, that is a very good answer. It's not the total answer I was looking for, but it's close. And the fact that you said that suggests that you're really starting to intelligently and intuitively understand how you want to look at the cloud and its components. Very, very critical. Um, so that's, you definitely get points for that. Shep is saying uh, the flipping of the cloud here, uh, the switching there, is something that would suggest, um, actually, that flipping would suggest that it's stronger. Um, but you're on to something there. Any last guesses whatsoever? And I'll explain why that flipping would suggest that the signal is getting stronger. The red horizontal line. The red horizontal line is the Kijun line. Uh, the the Kijun line there. Uh, that has some information. Actually, there's some good, there's some good insight into that, um, and that's useful, definitely. Uh, Gibby saying the angle of the AMA, um, the angle. Okay, there we go. There's some more bonus points. Uh, not moving up. Those are all excellent, excellent answers. Um, <clears throat> the one I'm really thinking of is this. Which part of the Senku span is on top? Senku span B is on top. Senku span A is on the bottom. <clears throat> this was the golden star award, basically. Senku Spin A. Senku Spin A was upside down. It was belly facing down on this one here. That means that generally when you're in a trending environment, the Senku Spin A will always be in the direction of the signals until that trend flips directions. So the Senku Spin A, if we're in a downtrend, the Senku Spin A, this white portion of the cloud, should be on the downside. Um, in this case, it's not. Um, the Senku span A is on the bottom side, and we're getting an upward signal. So that is a subtle point in the cloud, but it actually weakens the strength of the signal. That would be a sign. Maybe we want to reduce the position size a little bit. Um, it's belly facing down, and it should be belly up. So um, act, very subtle component, but you always want the Senku span A to be in the direction, or to you don't always, but it helps more if the Senku Span A is in the direction of the signal. It's on the same side as the signal. In this case, it wasn't. The other thing that adds to the strength of the signal is the Senku Span A is moving at an angle that is similar to, or is angling in the direction of the actual trade. So if we have a downward trade, a downward or declining Senku Span A would be more beneficial to us. That would increase the strength of the actual signal. So subtle components there, um, things that we normally don't get to talk about, things that aren't even really talked about in most uh, Ichimoku Cloud forums, books, comments, uh, things like that. I, I, I haven't seen anybody talk about this. Maybe in the Bible of Ichimoku Cloud, which is called, Ichim or it's called uh, Ichimoku Kinko Studies, by Hidenobu Sasaki, uh, very hard book to find, only in Japanese. Um, so with that being said, maybe it's mentioned in there. 
Um, but the bottom line is, is that you just won't find this in any ordinary commentary. This is just stuff that comes out of the mad mind that I have because I look at charts way too much. Uh, Jerry saying, can I repeat the last part, please? Sure. I'm going to help you help me, Jerry. The Senku Span A, which is this white portion of the cloud, you always want this to be moving, uh, or more often than not, it helps the trade if the Senku Span A is in on the side of the cloud that the direction of the trade is. Therefore, if we have a downward signal, we want Senku Span A on the bottom. If we have an upward cross, we want Senku Span A on the top. Now, just because it's not that way doesn't mean that we don't take the trade. We just trade it more cautiously. Um, the other thing, the other component is when we trade, it helps that the Senku Span A is angling in the direction of the trade that we're the crossover that we want to go. So if it's a downward crossover, it'd be nice and it helps if Senku Span A is moving to the downside. If it's an upward crossover, it helps if Senku Span A is moving and angling to the upside. All of that adds to the strength of the actual signal. So awesome, we answered your question there. Okay, so I just covered point number one. I'm going to blaze through point number two, and then point number three. Point number two is, is that if we get a downward crossover, price action needs to break through the downside of the cloud first to complete the signal. If it breaks through the opposite end of this cloud first um, before crossing over and negating the signal, if it breaks through the opposite end of the cloud first, that negates the signal because we wanted it to break to the downside, and it first broke to the upside. So if it does that, then that negates the whole signal. It's no longer a medium strength signal, it's a dead signal. So always make sure that when you get any sort of crossover inside the cloud, that you break through the direction of the signal on that side of the cloud first before uh, anything else. If it breaks through the opposite end, signal's toast, burnt toast, which I hate. And by the way, in case you don't know it, burnt toast is actually carcinogenic. The actual burnt portion of the toast is carcinogenic material. So if you can, avoid eating burnt toast at all possibilities. Just a side note. Okay, so I covered that second point there. You never knew you'd come here to FX Street and get health and nutrition tips as well. Um, this is the part that everybody pretty much cued in on. And Polly G, you actually kind of stole my thunder there um, because that was my surprise announcement at the class was that um, we're about 90% done. We've actually completed our, our beta version of the automated for the Ichimoku Cloud Strategies. Uh, so there you go. <clears throat> I'll talk about that later. So the thin portion of the cloud is always something we want to pay attention to. If you ever see, like if price section's over here and the cloud ahead is thin, it says beware. It says beware because the line of least resistance is neither to the upside or downside. There is just as much propensity for the pair to go to the downside as it is to the upside. You have just as much possibility because the cloud isn't going to put up a fight. The garrison is very thin and weak, mostly composed of peasants. <clears throat> so with all that being said, anytime you see a thin cloud, plan on hitting your short profit target, and then bringing the stop to free very quick. Look at the, the earliest possible point to bring your stop to free and neutralize risk. Because as the price section gets towards that thin cloud, it has a very equal chance of going to either, set, uh, either side of the cloud. And so with that being the case, um, that means that it could reverse and hit a trailing stop very quickly. So make sure your trailing stop is at break even at that point, and that you've already locked in some profit. Uh, so Din is saying, T-tips from Derek and toast from you. What, I don't give T-tips? Come on now, I've been giving T-tips for a long time. But I'm open to Derek giving T-tips too. We can both share that. We can share a piece of the pie. So hopefully you all had some good pie over, uh, hopefully you had some really good pie over Turkey Day. Uh, I went to this uh, fundraising dinner for uh, a children's uh, orphanage. Uh, we got to raise a lot of money, but they also had a lot of pie. And that's also, uh, that's my favorite thing. The pumpkin pie is just, oh. Where's the 20 EMA? Sorry, this was a, a very specific customized chart. Um, I apologize. You can slap me on the uh, internet wrist here. There's my 20 EMA. 
Although this whole chart is going to be disappearing because this is a custom chart. I just wanted to show back, I show you this this point in time where you have this kind of Senku span A on the opposite side. Doesn't happen too much, but when it does, beware. Okay, but all of you get credit. All of you actually set all of your guesses actually had intelligence in them, and they all would have been important information that we would have wanted to notice. So everybody across the board that answered, you all actually, uh, you all technically had a, a correct answer. Uh, there was the golden answer, but you all had a correct answer. All right, now I'm going to undo the charts for a second, undo the cam, and then I'm going to start getting into market questions. It's time to get into the market. Okay, so camera's coming back, and since we're getting into market questions, I just want to read up Zool's real quick. I'm going to look at those pairs after I look at these first two. So we're going to get into it. Um, so Zool, your question's coming up. Uh, don't think that I've forgotten you. I haven't forgotten you. Um, so let's, let's talk about current market environment. Actually, I'd like to start off with the euro dollar on the daily chart. Uh, I wrote an article about this, but my prediction uh, for the rest of the year and for the rest of December is that euro dollar, unless by the 6th, I think it is, or the 8th, if the euro dollar doesn't close above these highs by the 8th, I suspect it's going to remain below, in my opinion, based upon Ichimoku Cloud analysis, I suspect it's going to remain below the 130.86 level in between this little range here, with the bias more likely to the downside. Uh, than an upside break. That is because this cloud is declining as time goes on. There was a subtle window for it to break through over the Turkey Day weekend, but as time goes on, the cloud is declining. The ceiling is getting lower. It's also getting thicker, saying that this pair, as time goes on, if it doesn't really muster up something here, um, then we're going to be in a situation where it's going to be much harder for it to break through to the upside. It's going to have to fight through a lot more resistance. Um, you got the Kijun line here, the 20 MA, they're all coming in together. Um, they're all flattening, uh, which also suggests it'll be harder for it to break through the upside. Um, you do have some divergence in the momentum that's helpful, but it's not uber impressive. It's very choppy too. It's not smooth, it's choppy. Suggesting that internally the uh, order flow is having to fight just to hold on to the levels that it does. So beyond the 6th, 7th, or 8th, um, I think the chances for the euro closing the year above 130 decline. Uh, and so I think by time early, mid next week, if we don't get past this level uh, and none of the oscillators get super bullish or anything like that, then I anticipate, based upon the Ichimoku Cloud analysis, that euro will be stuck in this range. And that gives us some play opportunities. That gives us some information. Um, so, you know, it had a few a brief foray above the Kijun line. But brief it was. It was only a handful of days, and same thing here. Every time it's gotten above the Kichin line, only a handful of days, and then boom, it's down, back down below it. So all of this is not helping the outlook for the year end for the euro dollar. Uh, I want to zoom into the one hour. Uh, euro dollar has gotten quite bullish in the last few hours. Uh, it's gone from a low of 25.5 all the way up to about 27.5. Uh, we've broken through several pivots. And we've broken through the first portion of the cloud. Uh, we had a weak upward crossover. Notice how the pivot right here, R2 pivot, is right at the top of the cloud. Now, based upon Ichimoku analysis, in my opinion, if it were to bust through the upper portion of the cloud, then there would be some scope for it to go to the R3 pivot. First, it would, you know, 128 would be a stopping point. And then after that, the R2 pivot, R3 pivot, which is at 2826. There'd be scope for that, in my opinion. Do I believe that's necessarily going to happen? No, I'd want to see other oscillators and everything in favor. Of it. But all of this suggests that it's pretty overextended. In, right now, short-term momentum, next 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, suggests this still thing's got some upward gas in it. But the CCI is kind of tacking out. And it's basically suggested that this thing is running out of steam and may not be able to hold these levels. Although it's an impressive break, it's nothing special. Um, it's also a weak upward crossover according to the Ichimoku Cloud. So we got FIB levels coming in right around the R2 pivot. 
And we got this nice 61.8 right around 128, very handsome bids. So if you still think euros to the downside, or that the next move is to the downside, you have some levels that you could possibly uh, short at. Um, so just, just some suggestions out there. But also notice, this cloud is very thick. If it were to turn to the downside, the lines are very close to each other. We'd be creating a medium or strong signal, more than likely a medium signal. And with that being said, then once we broke through the downside of the cloud and the daily pivot, there would be a, probably enough gusto to go to the M2 and S1 pivots. So you have some downside play there. Um, if it were to break through the lows at 25 and a half and the M2 M1 pivot, then it seems like scope would be for the S1 uh, and beyond. So this could be setting up. This is kind of uh, the first one on my hit list. Is the one hour chart for the euro dollar. So keep an eye on this one here. Uh, this one could be quite interesting. Um, taking a look at the 30 minute, and uh, FAT, your question was, uh, can we look at pound yen in 30 minutes? Yes. We're going to be getting into, after this, we're getting into pound dollar, then we're getting into euro yen and pound yen. So we're going to be covering all that, and then we're getting into Zul's question, yours question. <clears throat> this one actually created a medium, actually created a weak crossover signal. So technically it's weak. But one thing I would like to note, Look at the nice little rejection at the R2. Uh, one thing I would like to note is, is the cloud is uber, uber thin right now. It's nothing special. Um, that suggests right now that for the next, for now until the, towards the European session, uh, if this thing were to sell off beyond the daily pivot, it, it probably wouldn't encounter too much of a fight. Resistance, uh, there's definitely some resistance above, and there's some support below, but it's not uber strong. The clouds are saying, hey, for the next, you know, 12, 14 hours, going all the way into the European session, there's not much to hold this thing up right now, other than some pivots and some short-term moving averages. So keep an eye on the euro dollar on the 30-minute chart. Not that it would activate a signal. It would activate a weak signal, and that would suggest a little cycle between this little floor and the ceiling. <clears throat> the better signal is on the one hour. But just note on the 30 minutes, very thin cloud. Okay. Sounds like a Native American name, thin cloud. <coughs> on the 30 minute on the pound dollar, we had a weak upward cross over, and then we have some separation here. <coughs> if we were to sell off and go to the downside, we would have a medium or strong crossover. That plus the break of the M2 pivot suggests that we'd probably go towards these, you know, lows here. In my opinion, that's where things are kind of suggested. The interesting thing to notice, as we get to the Asian session, this cloud is not looking pretty. So if this trade doesn't materialize, you know, in the next four, five, six, seven hours, um, it's not going to be that exciting because you're going to carry it into the Asian session with a very thin cloud and therefore not necessarily the best situation for this thing to be moving heavily in one direction or the other. The thin cloud suggests that it could easily oscillate between this floor and the ceiling here. But no doubt, it's still on the horizon because it has the potential for a cell signal of the downside. So keep an eye on the 30 minute. This is part of the hit list. The one hour has kind of a, a slightly greater impetus for that. This is a little tough one to call because on this candle, they were separate. On this candle, they're right on top of each other. On this candle, they're right on top of each other. On this candle, they're right on top of each other. So how would I interpret that? Well, if there's no separation, I mean, we basically came into it and then went flat. So if there's no upward angling and there's no separation, then I would almost venture to say that this was, there was never an upward crossover. Uh, they shadowed each other at a flat angle, but not even at an angle. So with that being said, um, I would venture to say there was never an upward crossover. However, if we can get some separation to the upside, then we'd have it, and then we'd have some sort of uh, closure to that upward crossover. It would be considered a weak signal. That means that the next downward signal on the one-hour chart would be a strong signal, a likely strong signal. So keep an eye on this one here. This one could produce a strong signal in the near term. And the outlook for the pound as a whole hasn't been too great lately. 
Um, other things to note, fibs aren't totally clean on this one, but they do come in with the pivots very nicely. Let's see if it looks any better here. Ah, a little bit better there. Nice little price action bouncing off of it. So that's why it's not respecting the daily so much. It's uh, kind of bouncing in between the fibs. This fibs line up actually a little bit better. So you have some possible rejection points if you're a rejection trader. Um, just some thoughts there, though. That is also on the hit list. Now, time to get in Urien and Poundian. And since we're getting into Urien and Poundian, it's time to answer my man Zul's question. Zul saying, Chris, and I don't know if this is your voice, but I'm an imitator here. Chris, when the Poundian and the Urien start to sell off yesterday, I noticed that the Nikkei followed by Europe and U.S. stock indices drop before these pairs sell off. Is there any link between those currency pairs and the indices? Is there any link? I think the, the, the term would be correlation. Yes, there's absolutely a correlation between global indices, particularly the Nikkei and the Dow uh, and the European indices. There is correlation between them. The general, there's a general correlation, which is that if those indices are dropping and dropping heavily, that generally means that the yen pairs will drop heavily because there's a, a risk aversion theme and there's a flight to quality. That being the case, um, yes, there is a correlation. That is a very common theme. Um, when it's heavy selling in those indices, you generally see the yen pairs sell off heavily. Um, and so that should answer your question about the link between um, the indices and the yen pairs. But, you know, like when the Dow and all those things have massive drops, probabilities increase that the yen pairs are going to fall. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Apology has a question. You're welcome, Zul. Apology has a question going back. Chris, if you sell the euro and the pound, it would be buying U.S. dollars. Is that too much risk? Why would that be too much risk? Um, maybe doing both at the same time might be, but how is buying U.S. dollars too much risk considering over the last six months, the U.S. dollar has beaten up every single pair across the board, except for the dollar, except for the yen. It's the only pair it's lost ground against. Over the last six months, the U.S. dollar has smashed and beaten up, bludgeoned, bullied, pounded, destroyed every single pair that it's gone against, except for the yen. I mean, against the euro dollar, the euro dollar right now is down 3,300 pips over the last six months. Pound dollar. I think it's like 4,500. Uh, it's actually 5,000 pips. Um, let's talk about uh, Aussie dollar. Uh, this thing was at 98. It's at 64. So 2,400 pips. Actually, one fourth of the value of the Aussie dollar is declining. 25% decline. Dollar CAD. Last six months. Oh boy, dollar CAD was at one. It was at parity. Now it's at 124. So dollar CAD beaten up. Kiwi dollar. Just marauded. So 78, now we are at 53, 2,500 pips later. So how would that be too much risk? If you could explain that to me, uh, maybe you have something else that you're thinking of, but right now the dollar is beating up things as a whole. Um, this daily downtrend is still in place. There's no reversal signs or patterns or signals. There are some minor cases where there was short term, uh, there's a short term impetus for a reversal but none of those materialize into medium or long-term reversal potential. So with all that being the case, I, I'm not sure how that would be too much risk. Um, there's more red candles than blue candles. The red candles are bigger than blue candles all across. Um, all across. The okay, so you had, there was another point. Just buying too much on one currency, diversification. It's an excellent point. Um, do I necessarily want to double up on it? It would depend on the nature of those signals. If I had some really good strong signals, I would be open to it. Um, and, you know, I can also reduce position size if I want to. That's one way to deal with that. Um, you're also looking for short-term profit targets on those 30-minute time frames. You're only looking for 30 pips and then your stop's brought to free. So if you feel confident that you can get those first 30 pips, then you're really in a very low-risk situation. But it's an excellent point and it's definitely something worth considering. Okay, let's get back to some euro-yen. Let's talk about a 30-minute time frame here. So again, 
your yen create a weak signal. It has broken through the upper end of the cloud. Um, it's not super bullish, but it's there. If it were to cross over the downside in the next handful of hours, it would be a medium to strong signal. This would be one of those things that you want to take your profit quickly, you know, your first 30 pips and bring the stuff to free because as we go in the agent session, the thin clouds awake. So this would be one of those things that you'd want to reduce risk going into the Tokyo session as much as possible. So keep an eye on the year yen on the 30 minute chart. It didn't really have anything on the one hour chart. Pound yen, which FAT wanted to look at, let's take a look at that. Very thick cloud. Thin cloud up ahead, but very thick cloud. Weak signal the upside. Therefore, crossover the downside would be likely strong, in my opinion. With that being the case, taking a look at pivots just below the 139 level, you have this M2 pivot. Uh, it seems like, in my opinion, if it gets past the M2, we should at least make our way down to this portion of the range. You know, or something around here, somewhere in the lower 138s. Last time I did it, it got pretty close. It did have a spike back, but we were able to make it there. Uh, the next time we got below it, same thing. We were able to get to the lower uh, 138 levels. And so with all that being said, um, keep an eye on the downward crossover. You should have some minimal pit movement. And if you're lucky, you get a little bit more, down to 137. So keep an eye on that one there. Um, but a potential signal on the 30-minute chart, uh, potential strong crossover, the one hour is actually a little bit better. It's a little bit better because the cloud is thick for a while. The cloud is thick all the way in for the first um, till 10 o'clock California time, so 1 o'clock New York time the next day. So we have some space here with the cloud. Also notice the top of the cloud and the uh, daily pivot all coming in right around the 141 and a quarter level offers uh, some pretty good resistance areas. So, and then the top of the cloud is also the M3 pivot. So you have these interesting pivots, cloud combinations coming up there. So keep an eye on that. Now we still have yet to do an upper crossover to actually complete the last downward signal. Once that happens, it'll be weak. That means the next downward crossover, as long as it happens before 5 or 6 tomorrow California time, that it'll likely, in my opinion, be a strong crossover. Therefore, we have a pretty good signal at least to hit, you know, more, the likelihood of it hitting our first profit target is pretty high. So keep an eye on this one here. Uh, this pound yen is uh, pretty close to producing a signal within the next handful of hours. Okay, real briefly, I want to chime in with the rest of my hit list. I got Aussie dollar, Kiwi dollar, and Kiwi yen. Aussie dollar is on the same time frame. We have this one hour potential signal. Now, the cloud does get a little bit thin up here. So there's a little bit of a window towards the beginning of the Tokyo session. So keep an eye on that. The Aussie dollar has uh, some potential to bust through here. And you also got this R1 pivot that is trying to break through but hasn't been able to successfully. But if it were to cross over the downside, it would likely be a strong signal. If it goes into the later Tokyo or European session, it would be a medium signal. You got this daily pivot and then the cloud to clear through. Once that happens, it looks like the M2 and the S1 pivots would be under attack. So keep an eye on that one there. Potential signal on the Aussie dollar on the one hour chart. And Kiwi dollar, I need to zoom into a 30 minute. And so Kiwi dollar is very much, the 30 minute charts are actually looking all very similar. They're decent until around Tokyo session and then they get, the clouds get very thin. So if we don't see massive selling, uh, we should create a medium or strong signal to the downside. If we don't see it soon, then as time goes on, the, the window of opportunity decreases. Um, but it would suggest a downside attack on the M2 and then the lows around 52 and a half. In my opinion, that's where it's suggestive of. Um, but ideally, we would like that to happen fast. Otherwise, as time goes on, uh, the, you know, the signal would not be, you know, uh, leaning towards a, a, a prolix or a, uh, a continuation of uh, the clouds being very favorable. Uh, it would be less towards that. So hopefully that kind of gives you some idea there. But on the 30 minute, you want to watch for it. Kiwi Yen, very interesting Kiwi Yen. Uh, nice little sell-off, consolidation, subtle break to the downside, but nothing major. 
never quite attacked the daily pivot, but we're stuck between the key June and the close to the daily pivot there. So around 49, 40, and 50 is very interesting. The daily pivot uh, is that a nice round number there. I'm not sure if this lines up with the FIB. I doubt it, considering that's a very long downward move. It's possible, just for entertainment's sake. Let's do it. Close, but not entirely. Um, but with all that being said, it has some interesting rejection possibilities here. Um, but if it also crosses over the downside and breaks below the daily pivot, that suggests medium or strong signal, and it suggests an attack on 49 and then these uh, other levels down here, 48 and a quarter roughly. So a break below that really opens up the floor uh, towards the S1 and then beyond. Not to infinity and beyond, but to the S1 and beyond. And yes, we can wrap up very soon here. That's not a problem. So that is last of my hit list. Um, Boyke said, you did not say why the 20 EMA turns me on. Did I say it turns me on? Did I really say that? And I hope we didn't record that. Um, if I did, oh boy. Um, I'm not sure exactly what I meant by that. But OK. Wow. That was, uh, you have to, I have to confess you got me there, Boyke. Congratulations. Very rarely that I'm a hat like that. I'm usually the hatter, the mad hatter, not the, not the one had. So we've got about five minutes left. I just want to see if anybody has any market questions, pairs they're looking at, time frames, trades they're in. I have about two and a half minutes to field questions on the actual uh, pairs and markets, current environments. And then after that, I've got to wrap it up with final closing, uh, closing arguments here. Uh, and then the defense will rest this case. So why use the 20 EMA? Wonderful question. Out of all the EMAs I've seen out there, I found the 20 EMA to be not only the most beneficial in terms of information, but also the market seems to respond to it the most. On daily charts, one hour charts, on a lot of the time frames, the market seems to respond to the 20 EMA a lot. And because the market often responds to it, that means people are paying attention to it, and order flow is going to be more likely parked around it. Um, if I had to pick an EMA that institutional and bank traders are probably watching the most, it's probably the 20. So this is how it ends up working out. Um, why is the 20 so popular? It's because most global markets, or you know, if you're trading indices, commodities, or whatever, are generally five days a week, so in a general month you have 20 trading days. The 20 EMA is also very useful because it's, it's got a nice balance between the shorter and the long term. It's sensitive to price action, but yet it also incorporates a little bit longer data, so it's also smooth. It's not super jagged. Um, and so with that being said, the angle of the EMAs, um, all that gives me a lot of information. Um, Din saying, does the 20 EMA have the same significance across all crosses? Um, the 20 EMA has a lot of significance with pairs that tend to trend consistently. Pairs that are stuck in range-bound environments for a good portion of the time, no EMA is going to be useful um, because the EMAs are tracking acceleration or deceleration of price action, and since we're in a range, there is neither. So therefore, no EMA is going to be useful. So if a range-bound cross is not really. When we get into trending environments, yes. Uh, the 20 EMA is going to be very potent, particularly on the daily and one-hour charts. Boyke says, why did you add to the Ichi? Um, I added it to the Ichi because the 20 EMA is something I like on all my charts, uh, just based upon how the market responds to it, the information it has. Um, I don't use it in relationship to the crossovers like, you know, the Tankin and the Kijun line. But uh, to me, it's like one of those staple indicators. It's like momentum. I always want it up there uh, because I understand it as great information. And to me, it's a very potent EMA, probably the most potent one. I, I, if I only had to trade one EMA ever, it would be the 20 EMA. If I could only have one EMA up, I would have the 20 EMA up. That's how strongly I feel about it. Andy saying, Chris, I see you have the CCI and momentum indicators on your car chart. What type of role do additional indicators play with the Ichimoku? Or do you even need them? And thoughts on stochastics? Okay, we're getting into this question and shocker too. These are good questions. 
Um, yes, momentum to me is a staple indicator. The reason why I have momentum up there is because there are four categories of indicator, and I always like to have one indicator up from every classification or category. Um, the categories of indicators are trending indicators, moving averages fall into that. Second category of indicators is oscillators. Um, one classification of that would be like a MACD or a stochastic. Um, these are generally designed to give you clues as to when there's swing changes in pairs. The definition of a swing in technical trading is just the change in direction of a pair. Um, that's what oscillators are generally trying to do, or try and give you clues into overbought or oversold levels. Um, the third category of indicators is volume and volatility levels. Volume volatility indicators. ETR, Bollinger Bands are like that. Um, if we had volume analysis, then you could do that. Um, but volume and volatility indicators, ATR and Bollinger Bands. And then the last category of indicators is momentum-based indicators. Rate of change, momentum, those are all momentum indicators. They all, each category is designed to gauge different pieces of information from the actual technical environment. When you have, a lot of people have too many of one. They'll have too many oscillators on or too many volume volatility indicators on or too many trending indicators on. That creates an effect called collinearity where all of them are really giving you the same information. They're not telling you anything new. Therefore, there's not, you might as well just have one of them if they're all going to say the same thing. Why have two and three and four of the same indicators? completely useless. But you don't get any new information out of them. You might as well just pick the best one of all of them. Uh, do they play an additional role with the Ichimoku? Absolutely, because the Ichimoku has moving averages and it has this support resistance leading indicator. With that being said, I have the trend and the support resistance indicators in there, but I don't have anything gauging momentum and I don't have an oscillator in there gauging swing changes. Um, the moving averages in combination with the cloud kind of fill that void to kind of tell us when things are changing. But the bottom line is, is that they don't have that built in there. So I always like to have momentum in there because I'm always concerned about the internal momentum. And the CCI, if I'm going to have another indicator up there, CCI would probably be it. It's very good at uh, timing cycles and swing changes. That's the specialty of the CCI. Not measuring overbought or oversold levels. That was not the original intention of CCI. The original intention of CCI was to really actually determine uh, change in market timing and cycles. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, and thoughts on stochastics? I think stochastics, I do not like them as an indicator. I found them to be very um, useless. Um, I found better indicators for them. That doesn't mean that stochastics is bad if you use them. I know some people who make stochastics, they trade well off stochastics. Um, but to be honest, I don't... Uh, I don't like stochastics as a whole. So I don't use them. But again, there are plenty of successful traders that use them. Doesn't mean they're bad. They have their use. That's it. So I need to wrap up. Last question here, shocker two. Does it work better on the one hour or 30 minutes? Um, it works a little bit better on the one hour, but still incredibly useful on the 30 minutes. Um, because the one hour is one of those time frames that's a base increment of how actual things close. Markets close on one hour time frames, not necessarily on 30 minute time frames. Um, you know, the beginning and ending of the London session on a one-hour time frame, not necessarily a 30-minute increment. So one hour is a little bit more potent uh, increment in terms of time. And so uh, that's all I have time for questions. We need to wrap this up. Real briefly, I would like to show you something interesting, and then I'm going to close it. Uh, take a look at this, uh, our beta version of our Ichimoku Cloud uh, system is done. Check out the accuracy on this bad boy clocking in at 85 percent. So out of 296 trades, it's winning 257. Um, we're in our final testing phases um, this uh, week. We're just going through a series of tests right now and baiting the thing. But once that's done, oh boy, auto execution via MT4. So not just through a specific broker, via MT4, this thing will be available. Uh, and that means you can just have this thing. It's got all of my proprietary parameters for the Ichimoku Cloud built in. Total badass. So this is just going to totally shift everything for me in terms of trading. That means I can spend less time at the charts and more time when the auto execution take care of things for me. So anybody that's interested in any of my services, visit me at my website, www.2indskies.com.
or you can email me directly if you have questions. If you're interested in the E2MOOC cloud for auto execution via MT4, visit my website, email me directly, and then you can ask me those questions. Um, so I'm just going to thank everybody around the horn. Let's go down the list here. CBJ, Alex, John Noel, Marcus, Mark, Ray, Jose, Chef, good to see you, Strat, Salute, Fact, Fact, Fast Fact, Snow, Now, whatever, sorry, that was awful there. Bones, Ruth S, Boyke, Zool, Fat, JM, Maduro, Jeff S, Dave F, Holly G, Ula, nice to see you as well, Hoff, Bobby Brown, Dr. Updown, Ed, Jerry, Din, Win Effects, Sugar Gas, Bond, Ashu, Leo, Andy, Eduardo, Lance, Richard M, Wen, good to see you, Azur Master, Max Ramirez, Shocker 2, Netstar, and Casey J. Thank you all very much for coming. I hope to hear from you. I hope to see you on my website. I hope you, uh, yes, said I've been testing this on the live account for the last year. Um, actually, most of the trading that's been done on White Knight Investments has all been live. Uh, at, what, what am I saying? It's all live. Um, and so I've been testing Ichimoku uh, since the beginning of 2008, but it just was recently programmed. So hopefully that answers your question there. So thank you all for coming. Stay on for our next class here. Um, I hope to see you guys again. Take care, good hunting, and I will talk to you later.